you know, I picked for 2019, coming off of 2018, leaving Acts 29, seeing, you know, what was brewing, the storm that was coming. I picked uh, 1 Timothy to preach through. You know, Hymenaeus and Alexander, I've handed, you know, uh, or in the very beginning, it's like, um, Timothy, I charge you, um, or, um, or I, I, um, I, I'm encouraging you to charge certain elders, certain men, certain leaders in the church not to teach any different doctrine. And so, you know, that was like, second sermon in the series and boom people left and then 2000 uh, or when we got to first timothy chapter 2 verses 9 through 15 i slowed down instead of speeding through it i did four weeks on that text i only planned to do one week but i ended up doing four weeks and talking about um talking about the you know the the callings of men and women and the distinction between the genders one of my big lines was it's not male and female uh roles he assigned them but male and female natures he designed them like the difference goes all the way down to the way that we're made Mm -hmm. um and i started talking about how and that extends i believe that extends beyond the home and the church if 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 husbands are the head of their homes and and then men as elders and i would argue for a male diaconate are are the head of churches but then when we step outside of homes which is the building block of any society <laughs> is the family so that so yeah. we're saying that an entire society is made up of even in a non-religious um uh, culture a, a entire society is made up of the building blocks of families and men are explicitly called in scripture to lead those but then women when we step out of the home <laughs> women start leading their husbands you know, like it just doesn't make any. So I was yeah. like, all right, the civil magistrate bears a sword. The sword is a phallus. It belongs to men. Like, and I started just, you know, and it, I mean, I know those are strong statements, but I started thinking beyond the home and the church and say, let's start there. But I think the implications, I think we do need to, to be more careful the further we get away from what scripture explicitly says, home and church. But to act as though this is exclusive to those realms is foolish. And so I started preaching on that and started preaching on false teaching, started preaching on critical race theory, started calling out Matt Chandler, you know, all all those kind of things and lost a ton of the church and it was all tone 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 and one of the things that i said was um i, I remember telling people i said um um a man will always be uh, labeled as harsh if he has the gall um to to fire off around <laughs> at someone who's charging if if his um comrades in that moment are sitting on a blanket in the middle of a meadow thinking that they're having a picnic right right, right? so like the, the first guy to fire off around with a platoon when when everybody else still thinks that this is just a drill right that, that, that we're not actually at war there's not actually a, th a threat the enemy's yeah. not at the gates and this guy has the audacity to fire off around and then everybody you know looks up from their sandwich and their pudding you know from the little picnic that they're having and they see somebody bleeding you know uh laying dead they're like what did you do what's wrong with you right. it's like well i like we're at war and they're like, no, we're not. And so I don't really think it's like, here's explicit biblical principles of why you cannot, you, you, it is inherently sinful to speak like this or to use this phrase or to call out in it. It is all 100% what you said. It's um, that, that pastor lied to you. I, he lied to you because he yes. knew where he was smart enough to know where you were going with the uh, question. Of course he did. Yes. Exactly. So he saw he saw <laughs> your sneak attack coming. So he he just blatantly lied to you. But the real answer is, of course, it's okay to name names and and to use strong language yeah. because the Bible says it's okay. And the only reason everybody has a problem with it is because at the end of the day, uh, we're not arguing about what's permissible yeah. in terms of of rhetoric. We're, we are arguing about whether or not we're actually at war. And the reality is, I think in the pew, yes, there's a dis disconnect from pastors in the pew, but I would also argue every other pew, because it's about half of the pew, I would argue every other pew is filled with people who have been influenced by those pastors. Absolutely. You know, so it still falls on pastors. Don't get me wrong. But um, but because it's so pervasive, this problem among pastors, then certainly it's infected some of the pews. Yeah. So there's no question about it. And you're... you're, you're very astute. He, he, of course, he lied to me. He lied to your and what's face. so interesting about this is that our my preaching style. I try to avoid um, like getting involved too much with sort of what's happening right at this moment in evangelicalism. So I, I try to stick in this, stay in the text, and explain the text. And I will make application, but I do try to avoid you know naming names or like or or like that kind of stuff from the pulpit because I just it's not my style, right? I, I don't think that's appropriate. But but what's so interesting about it is. 
this guy who told me this is known for this. Like his, he's naming names constantly, so long as it's safe names. Right. Rob Bell Joel or Osteen. or Osteen. Oh yeah, absolutely, Osteen. You know, and it's just, it, so yes, he was one hundred percent lying to me. But I think your point is also astute that there's a certain percentage of those in the pews that take a lot of their cues from those who wrote the books that they read, who went to speak at the conferences they go to and stuff like that. And so they are going to be influenced by this mentality where it's like, you know, t- tone, it, it, it's like tone really, it's like majoring on on such a minor issue. Like, okay, so we have a disagreement on tone. If it's if it's war times and you don't think, you think it's a picnic, you would agree that tone is, you should right. it get amped up. So what we're really arguing about, is it wartime or not? And the truth of the matter mm-hmm. is to some of these guys, and you know, we can go into names later if you want, but to some of these guys, there's literally nothing that could happen in the world that would warrant the tone as long as they're not all doing it. So once they all do it and they start, you know, uh, circling the wagons and they've, they've got all got a target, then it's game on for tone. Because mm. they, people can say horrible things about John MacArthur right now and nobody will call them out on it because he's an okay target. So like they've got this little cabal, this this guild, and if you're not in it, you're fair game. Mm. If you are in it, there's literally nothing you could say or do that 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 is fair game at that point right it's a very weird little yep little well, thing right. they got going but you on. just touched on i think it's so true that there's this hierarchy beyond the church and i've been at churches that have elders and say you know that's the most important uh you know leadership position that our church holds but oftentimes those elders if they've been trained at a seminary recently they're looking to beyond that they're they're aspiring to be at bigger conferences or get publishing deals and uh, most people in the pew don't really understand that because they they're not in that world. But there's very much a professional guild that exists, and even small time pastors, you know, out in country churches, sometimes want to play to that. And I think a lot of uh, people, sim- simple Christians who just want to live their lives, read their Bible, raise their kids, they're they're realizing something's off. Like my pastor, in in some cases, is not re- like doesn't seem like he's a shepherd of this particular congregation the sheep aren't really his primary concern there's like other like shepherds with bigger flocks that he's trying to win the approval of or something and so uh i think there there's been this kind of uh, crisis of um leadership and stability and trust and uh it's happening in everywhere in in every institution it's not just the church like this is just one area that we're focusing on but People don't know if they can trust their doctors now. They don't know if they can trust their uh, the governing officials. Um, they can't trust the media. They can't trust entertainment yeah. industry. They can't trust education. And now it's kind of down to the wire. And they're like, man, I can't really trust my pastor either. Mm-hmm. And um, I think what you said just now about, you know, it's like every other congregation. Like, I don't know all the stats on like who's kind of lining up where, but I do know this. I'd say every other pew. Other, every other pew? Okay. <laughs> within like one congregation, within. half of them are, yeah. Well, and that, you know, really is, that's probably true because I've traveled a bunch now at, at different churches across the country that have been the result of splits or they are themselves uh, gaining all kinds of people from churches that went right. COVID crazy or woke. That's and what we're doing right now. So, yeah, there's a lot of reshuffling going on right now. The dust hasn't even quite settled. Right. Uh, I think it's starting to. But um, one of the things AD and I were talking about this morning and I think it's just so interesting. I don't know like what we would need to do to figure out maybe more specifically what's actually going on. But one one of the, the ways to look at this is uh, men overwhelmingly watch AD's content and my content. Mm-hmm. Mine too. It's like 73%. That's, it's men. probably yeah, Basically the same for me. Yeah. At the YouTube, yeah. I think Three it's yeah, quarters, probably right? like 65, 70% right. uh, men. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems to me like men for like the last 20 years or so at least have been so like pushed aside by evangelical churches. Evangelicals try to reinvent themselves every 10 years and they, and they really do cater when they reinvent themselves to like middle class women, women in the yeah. suburbs yeah. generally. Their styles of music, like the way they even decorate their church, it's just like the personality a pastor is supposed to have is very emotional and uh, just it, it's not this masculine persona and it's it's what a lot of women tend to want and that's just my observation uh, that, that men tend to be alienated from the church they're not um, they're not writing songs that men are gonna even like want to sing as much they're, they're not catering to men so like men I think this like Christian men who just want to like read their Bible do what it says live for the Lord they're 
tend to more often than not, I think, see through this because they're not in that guild that we just described. They're, they don't care about the, the fluff, the icing, any of the, the stuff that evangelicals use, the pretty ribbons to get people in. They're really just focused on like the meat. Like what's the like the, the, the actual like um, solid, like biblical stuff that, that we're coming here for. And so the, the, the tone and the style doesn't influence them. And I think they're, they're seeing through it a little bit more. Not to say there aren't women, who, there are definitely women who are seeing through this for sure. Totally, yep. totally. and, I, and I know yep. some of them and, and I'm so grateful for them. Uh, but, but I think primarily evangelicals tend to be politically conservative. So that, that's raising an antenna already. And then, and then again, it's men who are then helping. Uh, I'm taking big, big scale here. There's women that are helping their husbands wake up, but more, more yeah, often than not, it seems general. like it's men. Yeah, in general, that it are, is men yeah. that but, are waking their wives up and saying, like, hold on, like this well, see, is not. I think that's the problem right there. Yeah. Um, that last part, everything you're saying is absolutely true until you got to that last part. And I would push back on whether or not that statement is true. In my experience as a pastor. Um, all the men, just virtually all the men. So I say every other pew. We could just say if all the men were sitting on a pew and all the women were sitting, then it is all the men. It, like virtually all the men are like, yes, this is ridiculous. I see through it. This is a, a, a thin facade. Um, but that last part where you said they're waking up their wives, I would say half of the men. That's where, that's yeah, where we lost. I, I think that's true. Because yeah. there's a ton of guys who are watching both of you. Yep. They're watching me. They're watching Eric Kahn. They're listening to Michael Foster. They're listening to Doug Wilson. They're like... Um, and, and I know this because I pastored a church with men like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they're, and they're talking to me and they're on board and they're excited. Um, and then word gets to their wife mm -hmm. and then they come back to me later on. Maybe it's a week later, maybe it's a few months later and all of a sudden something's different. Mm -hmm. And they, and it's like, they're begging me. They're not, not, they're not correcting me or chastising me, but they're begging me. Could you please tone it down a little yeah. bit? And I'm like, I'm why, why, sure. for what? For who, like, this isn't, we, we were just talking about this and, and you were so on board. Like, what happened? Oh, the, the head of your home is sent you to talk about this, your wife. That's what, that's what actually happened. It's pretty harsh. And, and then if you don't, yeah, it, yeah. And <laughs> they need, those men need to be, to be chastised. And, and they weren't actually leading their wives. Their wives were leading them and their wives led them right out of the church and the men left. But it wasn't because the men weren't on board. Um, the men were on board. They were excited for the first time. They actually came alive yeah. in a church and under a minister's preaching and felt like we're, we're doing something. We're going to war. We're gearing up. I've got a sword. I'm going to use it. There is an enemy. There's a purpose. There's a mission. There's a vision. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, um, but their lack of leadership in their home allowed their wife, the position to pour cold water on all of it. And then, and I, I watched those guys who were my friends leave the church yeah. and you could tell like the rich young ruler that he, he walked away sad. It, like I, I've watched men walk away from masculine pastors, yeah. not saying I'm the perfect example, but walk away from not just my church, but other ministries, other local churches where there actually was a man's man preaching and, and men like the rich young ruler walking away sad because, because the minister said, there's one thing that you lack. You need to uh, correct your wife. Mm-hmm. And they walked away sad because they had much wealth or they had an yeah. unruly wife. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that's one, absolutely true. One thing that I, I think about, especially with the woke church stuff, uh, there's one character in the woke church movement who I haven't thought about for probably a year until just this moment. So it's a man named Kyle Howard. And um, it's, he's, he's a pathetic man. I mean, it's, he's a very sad case. I think he's a tragic story, right? Um, I used to laugh about his antics, but really it just makes me sad because... He's just a shell of a man. He's he's constantly, you know, poor me. It's hard to be me. I'm traumatized. But I, I was at, I was joking this just today actually. There's a picture of a of a cot, a piece of cotton a cotton field in my uh, my hotel, and I just remember thinking, man, you know, I could be real triggered by that. <laughs> what are you trying to say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, put me in the cotton room, right? Yeah. But he would get he would go on Twitter and he'd be That's literally funny. serious that he was triggered by this, and he would he like, wept about it and stuff like that. Oh my and gosh. anyway, so. Um, most of his followers and the people who retweet him and stuff are women. And that makes sense to me because a, a, a woman's kind of nurturing nature, right? They don't, they don't want to see a man in pain. They don't want to see anyone in pain. Like when my kids are hurt, you know, and they need comfort, 
they go to mom because that's where they get their comfort right. from women and it's a beautiful impulse for women to comfort people right mm-hmm. that's one of their their prime you know you know skill sets is, is doing that you know even adults when you know you see sad stories of of, of adults uh, males dying and they call for their mom you know like because that's just it's it's in there right so men on the other hand though we, I want to comfort my sons, but sometimes it's like, you know what? You're okay. It's time to get up and you can walk this right. one off, right? right. Um, and the impulse that I have there is a good impulse because they do need to learn how to brush themselves off and pick themselves up. But the, but the impulse for my wife is also a good impulse because, you know, sometimes you do need comfort, right? And when, mm-hmm. you know, when you're a, a wife and you're uh, your husband's helper, there's going to be times when you need to be just for him and comforting him and, and things. Anyway, bottom line is, that this this woke stuff, I think, regularly appeals to women just naturally because they mm-hmm. want to make it okay, right? And I think men are naturally suspicious of it, right? Because they're like, "What's this man cry, crying over a picture? Is this serious?" <laughs> I cried over the picture that John pointed out with the Gospel Coalition uh, Christmas concert. The picture of the transgender oh. that made me go. <laughs> I was triggered by that. I, I felt like I needed to write a soap opera, you know, crying. <laughs> go ahead. So, <laughs> I was so triggered. By- <laughs> my point, <laughs> no, but my point is like in the home, if if I were to always let my wife get her way and comfort them always, and it's never time to stop to crying because, you know, it's not that bad. Like you, you know, I think we'd all agree, like you would ruin your sons if yeah. you did that. Yeah. They never knew what it was like to be like, man, that really hurt, but I'm just going to walk this one off. Right. Um, so, so, so we, I think we all probably know. <laughs> Husbands that that do defer to their wives and all that kind of stuff, and we, we have sympathy for them, and we know that that's not right, you know, given our beliefs, right? Um, we need to have just as much courage telling men in the woke context, or or or, the, or any theological issues context, where their wife is basically commanding the situation, that it's it's just as dangerous to allow your wife to to rule you in that way as it would be for your kids, right? Mm -hmm. We know we don't want our wives uh, making our, our, our boys into women. By how they treat them. So, but, but, but we, and so we're willing to rebuke people for that, but we also need to be willing to rebuke our friends who we know, know what's right, but they just kind of let it ride, let it happen. That's right. The way Um, it's what you said last night when we were getting dinner together, like, you know, they're waiting for it to blow over. Yeah. But, but the reality is it like it reminds me of, of the armies of Israel, you know, standing on one mountain, the valley in between on the other mount is, you know, the armies of, of Philistine, uh, of Philistia, and, and Goliath is going out day after day, taunting, you know, mocking God and taunting the armies of the living God. And all of them are, you know, the Israelites are shaking, knees trembling, waiting for it to blow over yeah. um, and probably reassuring them. So this, this will pass. This too shall pass. This too yeah. shall pass. Yeah. It'll blow over. It'll blow. And it did blow over because one <laughs> actual man chopped off his head. Yeah. So, so all these guys are like, it'll blow over. See that, that's the thing. So these guys like all the way full circle, what you said, they will call out names. They'll call out Joel, Joel Osteen. They'll call out Rob Bell. Um, but this is what they're doing. Um, they are completely comfortable uh, going up and kicking the the already slain rotting corpse so of Goliath once David already killed him. So so Absolutely. it's so that's the problem. Is it like so you got a bunch of pastors over here, right, patting themselves on the back, right, virtue signaling is that this pseudo courage. They're all standing in a circle kicking Goliath, but but his four other brothers are still alive and large walking and terrorizing their families these they, they have a responsibility so there's sheep being slaughtered ravaged you know giants just taking them and eating them and and these pastors over here kicking goliath that yeah. david already chopped off his head and then the david is over here trying to take on the next one you're describing the, you know, the like, rise and fall of marcel podcast yeah you're you know right what i mean they, yeah at the time they were all doing the same thing that they always do with with mark driscoll Yep. Which is, yeah, you know, no big deal. And then it finally blows up, right? I don't even know. I don't know all about this story, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But now it's safe right. to criticize Mark Driscoll. Right. So they're all doing it knowing that 10 years ago they were all defending him the way yep. they defend everybody. Mm-hmm. So whether Mark Driscoll is right or wrong, again, I don't know about the story that much. Um, they're doing what they typically always do. Yep. And so, and so now it's new people that are being criticized and in when 10 years, when it's safe to criticize whoever it is, I mean, who knows who's going to be the one to fall, but um, when it's safe to criticize Platt or Chandler or whatever, right. they'll all be doing the same thing, kicking yeah. the corpse again. And for our listeners, just to clarify, when AD says safe, what he means is um, 
when when the battle's already been won. It's already been won. Yeah. That's when yes. it's safe. It, it's safe when when actual men with actual courage are willing to step out yes. and and be attacked on both sides. The giants they're attacking and the people who are supposed to be on their team. So this is it, it really the illustration would be more accurate if David walked out from among the ranks of Israel and had to fight Goliath on one side and hold his shield on the other because <laughs> Israel's throwing rocks at him telling yeah. him that that he's being harsh. Yeah. And that's that's where we're at right now. Well, there's a term for it. It's called counterfeit virtue. Mm. It's not real. It's fool's gold. And so we, we've talked about how one of the motivations here is that there's this guild they're playing to. Many of these woke pastors, that could be one motivation. Another thing is uh, they want to impress. Men naturally do this. They want to impress, please gain the favor of their wives, of women in general sometimes. And if, if that's what's driving the church, like appealing to these middle class, you know, suburban women, then the church is just going to naturally fall into whatever the knee jerk emotional response is to a lot of this stuff. And then they'll, 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 you know, and that's that in and of itself is a virtue signal. There's counterfeit virtue there. Like you're not really putting any skin in the game. You're not sacrificing yourself. You're just going on with the crowd and, you know, not, nothing significant is actually even happening. But then afterward, like you said, with kicking the corpse, um, when it, and I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I was looking into Willie Rice this last week, right? Running for the right. SBC uh, presidency. And Willie Rice like hosted a super woke panel. And I know for those listening, if you're uninitiated into all of this, uh, I mean, we disagree with social justice for a variety of reasons, but among them is it destroys the very basis for revelation itself by making truth subjective in some way based on a social location. Uh, it also subverts Christian ethics because it makes justice somehow equal disparity and lady justice takes her blindfold off to treat some people different than others. So there's no equality before the law. Disparity equals discrimination. Right. They um, assume that. It also uh, oftentimes will merge with the gospel in, in heretical ways where it's like some kind of a gospel work or it's part of the gospel or it's you're failing to live out or understand or obey the gospel if you don't do the social justice thing, which which is very dangerous. Um, and it flattens reality. It shows instead of looking at people in the image of God, which they're obsessed with talking about, but it actually is an sort of laying an abstraction over everyone. So everyone's ones and zeros. You're looking at them as some level of oppression and you're reducing them down to that. So anyway, Willie Rice does this panel in 2020 and like he hits all of those things like right. in the panel. Like he's, I'm like, okay. He's speaking the woke language. He, he's, yeah. It's all critical race yeah, theory. He talks yeah. about white privilege. One of the guests uh, recommends Robin DiAngelo. Yep. Like he's talking about as a white man, I can't understand. I need your stories. You know, we can't question these stories. <laughs> we like the, people don't understand the, the uh, racism that's still around because of it's systemic and it's embedded right. and it's yeah. like the whole nine yards is in this like hour and a half almost presentation. Yet, if you look at Willie Rice today and the stuff he's saying about CRT, he's like, oh, it's it, it's against it's against what we believe as Christians. Sure. It's horrible. <laughs> it's And so yeah. I've tried to like make sense of this. Like, how do you, and he's one example among many, but like, how do you have a guy who's going to like, you know, blast CRT now that it's safe to do so. And it's on, you know, CRT is like becoming less popular. The pews are getting onto it. They're, they're understanding that's what's, I think this is the move you guys are doing. And now they're like, oh no, we're not doing that move. We're yeah. against it just like yeah. you are. Meanwhile, though, they haven't like repented of or recanted any of the previous things they've taught. They're still kind of bringing it in subversively through other channels. Right. So it, it's like the, it's a counterfeit virtue of like, ah, I want to please these people. So I'm going to say the right thing. I'm going to be against this because I'm a, you know, I, I want to, I, I mean, I, I can't question everything in Willie Rice's heart. I don't know. But on a, on a broad scale, yeah. um, there, there's, they're trying to bend to public pressure somehow instead of well, just remaining true to like, what does the word of God say? Absolutely. And, and part of the reason they're doing that, though, we should be encouraged by that. You guys especially should be encouraged by that because part of the reason that they're playing both sides is because now there actually are two sides. For the longest time, they didn't have to pay any homage. Right. They didn't have to do any lip service, any counterfeit virtue, um, because everyone was on the woke side. And now there are certain words they can't say, right? And, and there's certain things they have to they have to decry, like CRET. Now, they still absolutely believe all the same things. They still have a diversity council, you know, at their seminary and in their local church and all these kind of things. So they still actually believe all the tenets in terms of conviction, but they at least in their language have to decry certain things because the pushback, the battle, the, the fight is working. 
Like there, there is, we're winning. And, and, and the, the tide is turning. And I think like for me, just thinking like pastorally, so you said like, you know, part of it's cause the dust is still, still settling. So like, as you guys were like standing up and doing this thing for you guys, it was like, all right, I'm getting like thousands of views, you know? So it's like 2018, 17, you know, and, and you guys are taking a stand, you're saying stuff and you're like, whoa, I'm onto something. There's a lot of other people who are thinking, and it's either love, hate. Nobody's like, this was an interesting video. <laughs> you know, it's like, this was everything or, or go to hell, John, you know, or what, like, it's like one or the other. And, uh, but for me, I was having that same kind of experience, but behind a pulpit. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to play the world's smallest violin, but it was, it was hard because it was like, yeah. these aren't just YouTube comments. And I know you guys had yeah. real people, real f- friends and family. Oh, so I don't want to, um, I don't want to make light of that. But for me, it was like, these are people paying my salary. This is what I do for a living. Yeah. I've got kids, Absolutely. you know, and it, and it's, and it was hard, you know? And so, and so I was in real time watching um, exactly what Vody Bakum talked, you know, with fault lines. And mm-hmm. so that's what you're saying is like the dust is still settling. And now it's like, so now I have a church where I talk about way more of these yeah. things with way more candor and way more boldness and, and clarity, not beating around the bush at all, way more than I ever did in my previous church in California. Um, and all it does is just more people come, more people come, more people come. And I'm not saying there won't in the future be some problems with that. Yeah. Some people who maybe are, you know, they, they like this a little bit more than maybe yeah. they like, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, who, who are, you know, maybe, um, they, they hate, they hate wokeness, but not necessarily because they love Jesus because mm-hmm. there are other reasons they hate wokeness besides love for Jesus. You know, like James Lindsay does not love Jesus, hates wokeness, you know? So, yeah. so I may, I, I will pastorally have to sort through some things, um, down the line, but right now though, what's unique. And so I'm not saying everything's perfect now, problem solved, but what's unique is that like the fault that the, 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 uh, the fault lines have shifted Back in the day, it was like reformed, not reformed. That was the big, right? Those are the two big categories. Underneath that, in the reformed, you have the subcategories of um, like continuationism versus cessationism, Presbyterian versus Baptist, of course. Um, and then maybe, I don't know, maybe complementarian, egalitarian, you know, but it was like, I'm reformed and I'm going to fall into one of these, you know, categories. Maybe I'm like sovereign grace, you know, and, and we're prophesying and we like, you know, instruments of worship or what, whatever, or maybe I'm, you know, Presbyterian OPC, you know, and, and, but it was reformed. That was a big fault line. And now it's so crazy. So like we planted this new church now, I'm in Texas, Covenant Bible Church in April of 2021 one in my home we started with 20 people we already now have a hundred and it so it's been less than a year already a hundred people we're now meeting at a barbecue restaurant where john's gonna be preaching this sunday so <laughs> I'd add that to your resume that's a special that's right. thing so um but like it's it's exploded but it, what's funny is i'm uh, right now i just did a membership uh class and so i'm doing all my membership interviews with with these people who are pursuing membership at the church and um they're not all reformed I never in California it was like I just assumed if you're coming to my church it's because you're you're a Calvinist. Right, right. And so I'm like having to talk about the doctrines of grace. I'm like I haven't talked about the doctrines of grace. I mean I do every sermon but I haven't like yeah. had to persuade someone sure. who's pursuing membership in my church in like 7 years. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. so it's funny. You know what I mean? It's weird. And it's like I got continuationist. Oh, it makes perfect sense you know? though. And yeah. because because and and here's the thing. They know I'm a Calvinist. They don't like it. But 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 they're humble about it. They know I'm a cessationist. They don't like it, but but they're humble about it um, because that's not the biggest issue anymore. That's right. That's and, not and the I, biggest issue. I don't know if you remember maybe two, two and a half years ago. It was like right after the SBC 2018 to, I don't know, to somewhere in 2019, there was this sort of like unity, 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 like these issues, they're, they're not that important. I remember like Danny Aiken posting something about like Southern Baptist Convention has never been more united than it is right now. And like, and, and the, it's the, just a name it and claim it, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Speaking there, there of before it was, I was going, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, what are you talking? I remember this tweet when I back, when I had Twitter back in the day, I, I put out in like late, or I guess it would have been 2019, like early 2019 somewhere maybe. Um, anyway, I said like, like, what are you talking about? I think it was in reaction to that tweet. Like it's, the house is on fire. It was like one of those, the dog, like this is fine, you know? And um, I got like pushback. I remember like, and this is public. I remember like guys, um, one of them was like Chris Bolt. I remember came out and was like, like I didn't know what I was talking about really. And like, uh, you know, this it's it, the, really the thing we got to worry about is the Calvinist Arminian debate and stuff. And I'm like, are you like, really? Because 
this stuff is so fundamental. Like mm-hmm. we're talking about like, hey, is like reality objective or That's like right. are there like subjective like That's right. categories yeah. and like, you know, social locations that are barriers to yeah, knowing truth. Like that's the, so much yeah. more basic. The than conversation of the Calvinism. sovereignty of God falls under the parameters of true and false. <laughs> right. We right. have to figure that out first. <laughs> like it's. Right. Uh, and that's yeah. why James Lindsay as an atheist is like, like this conversation pertains to me. True and false. Now he doesn't have a reason, sure. a defensible reason for that. I, you know, like, I would I would push back presuppositionally and say, why do you care right. about true and false? But like, but it affects. He's right to recognize it affects everyone. Or like, like, hey, should like we steal from folks? Like, is that right. okay? Or like, <laughs> right. should we not? It's like, right. oh no, no, no. Calvinism, Arminianism right. is bigger than no, it's right. not. Yeah. Like that's so basic. Yeah. It's it's so, so basic, and so many people get it. Like you, you keep mentioning James Lindsay, which is a, good, a great example because um, he is a good avatar for a lot of atheists that I know that get it. They understand fundamental, you know, because they have to live in reality. That's right. Right. So they, they can deny God's existence, but they still have to live with God's existence and, right. and what he's created. Right. So mm-hmm. they understand that fundamentally there's some issues here. And um, I remember talking um, to you, John, that on the way here, actually, just 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 today, where I was like, there's so many things that I think are so important. Uh, about theology that I just don't, I choose not to talk about because it's like we, we just have bigger fish to fry fundamental fish that we need to fry up all every day because it's it's just such a uh, a threat to just our everyday lives and so what's what's happened is churches have I don't want to call it a new orthodoxy because that sounds heretical but like what's what's important to people as far as being orthodox are basic stuff like like you know basic human sexuality. Um, do you have a spine or are you just going to shrink the first time the government tells you that you can't go to church today because it's too dangerous? Like the COVID stuff has made this even more clear. It's like, how, how about this for orthodoxy? Is your church open? Mm-hmm. Like people are just looking for an open church. That's right. And it's like, so, so we've gotten so debased that it's like one way to know if it's a solid church or not is if it's meeting. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the old oh, days the we used thing, to yeah. we used to joke in the old days like you check their elders list if there's any women you don't go. It's not obviously that's not right. the, Nowadays is is it open? Yep. Is the church <laughs> open? Yeah, no, it's wokeness. It, if we could boil it down to like two big categories. It's like, you know, with COVID and all the kind of stuff, like the big category is tyranny, right? Political tyranny, medical tyranny, tyranny. And then and then with all the the race stuff and and all like it's it's wokeness. And if those two things, if somebody did a conference called Resisting Tyranny and Wokeness, <laughs> that would be super we'll helpful. That. And, and, and that would be so, that's like right on the money. That's yeah, what we need. I feel like I would speak at that. That's something yeah, I, you I would think I might at, be able to. You would be no. great. You would be fantastic. But you know, it's that. so amazing though, because we've, I think we've all, all joked that if you do a Venn diagram of woke churches and churches that were COVID tyrants, mm-hmm. it's a circle. It's just one circle. Totally. They're all the same. But, but it's right. the same no, issue. Right. It's, it's the same issue in right. many ways. Like the, in both cases, yes. it's a central authority that's going to be the savior in the, you know, that's it's right. going to redistribute things that's or right. it's going to save us from whatever the that's threat right. is. It's, it's just like more power to the government, more consolidation. Well, what go, go and ahead. So people, yeah. Sorry. sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, but, no, no, you're good. So, so the people that are at your church, Joel, that are like, you know, I don't understand this doctrine of grace thing, but you know, you're open. They like, they're getting it because you're actually worshiping God. Your help comes from That's God, right. right? And so these churches right. that are like, well, you know, the, the government's going to save us all by re- redistributing our money. The government's going to save us all by making sure we're all uh, vaccinated. Like, where does their help come from? Right. It, it doesn't seem to come from God, no matter how many psalms you can pretend to sing That's on right. Sunday. If you're singing psalms, but then you're deferring to your actual Savior, That's, right. that's so apparent to people, mm-hmm. you know, people that want to honor God. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um you can end up with like like for me I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian I go to a Baptist church and it's awesome I love being there because I know the pastor you know when he gets up on the on the pulpit he's worshiping and serving God you know it's just no he question has a spine. about it he, loves he the has Lord. a spine he loves the Lord look you can talk all about how God is your savior and is the king of kings and lord of lords but if you have no spine you don't actually believe it right and and that's what I want to remind people is okay we we want to be um our speech seasoned with grace we want yeah. um we want to be the people who if our brother sins against us seven times in one day and comes to, and I I got an interesting view on that though and he comes to you and <laughs> repents we forgive him seven times. Um, so we want to be forgiving. We want to be filled with grace. 
Um, but we also want to be, um, Jesus commends the shrewd servants is that, you know, the sons of darkness are more shrewd than the sons of light. We're called to be, you know, as innocent as doves, but also as shrewd or cunning as serpents. And so I know this sounds bad, but I, it's not, I, I truly believe this is not anti-gospel. It's not anti-grace, um, but it is pro-wisdom and pro-discernment, which is not an option, but biblically we are commanded to exercise discernment. And one of the ways we can tell if a tree is good or bad is the fruit that it bears. And so I want to urge Christians, um, you can forgive, and there's a debate to be had even about that, but, um, but you cannot forget, you cannot forget the last two years. And I would argue, right, because pastors fail. I'm a pastor. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like everybody else. Pastors fail. Um, but these last two years, I think in the providence of God, were different. This is not just like any other failure that a pastor might 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 have or any other mistake i think you look back on these last two years because guys are coming around now right so wh- wh- who's yeah. it willie nelson it's not willie nelson, <laughs> but, yeah, right the doobie smoking uh sbc guy <laughs> rice, no, no yeah. willie rice yeah rice. so i'm just kidding but uh um you're definitely in but, texas now huh? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so so willie rice you know like decrying crt but i listened to the panel because you had it in one of your podcasts and i listened to you played yeah. like the whole panel or at least like 20 minutes of it. And I listened to the whole thing. And I was like, this is hilarious. Yeah. That is so hypocritical. So night and day. And what I want to say is that yet, like repentance is a thing. God does grant, and I believe as a Calvinist, yeah. it, it is a gift and it's granted by God. The difference between Judas and Peter at the end of the day is that Jesus granted repentance to Peter and, and chose not to grant repentance to Judas. So repentance is a thing. God changes hearts. He changed Saul, and I'm sure it took a little while for Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, for, for Christians to say, we can trust this guy, to warm up to him, you know, after he killed their uncle or something like that. So I, so, so God does change hearts, and we should be willing to, to reconcile and, and eventually, you know, bring them back in. But I think, in, at least, I'm only 35 years old, but still, in my 35 years of living, there has never been um, what I would call a test Right? So people fail all the time. But what I would say is the last two years, this was the test. So when guys say, oh, well, yeah, I got it wrong, you know, but I see now and I'm coming. And I'm like, but no, 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 no. Like, right. So there, there are homework assignments every day. Right. And, and there are maybe, you know, projects once a quarter. Um, but this was like, this was these last two years. This was the SATs. This was the test. How you performed, I believe, how a pastor performed over the last two years is not, if, if he performed poorly, it's not a fluke. It's not a one-off. It's not, I had a bad couple of years. No, these were the years. This was yeah. the test. Everything in your life led up to this, and you failed. And, it's, and I think we should be slow to trust these guys again. Very slow to- well, God, God, God is gracious to us even in this because I would agree with everything you just said. Um, you know, forgiving someone doesn't mean be foolish. You know what I mean? So I get that. Um, but God, God, even though that was the SATs, He's given us like some bonus SATs since then. It's like right. just like a little humility would go a long way. Like you, you get these major things wrong: COVID, this woke stuff, all this. You know, and 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 you're the kind of person that you know. The next time the the, the you know CNN puts out a video of a police shooting, you know, you've always been the one. Oh yeah, it's racist without any information, right? right. And you and then sometimes they even apologize after the fact. I, I remember uh, Greer apologized for something he did, kind of. In 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 it. it Apo- it wasn't, apo- yeah, it was, apologize, apologized yeah, yeah, yeah. is a sliding scale when we're talking about evangelical <laughs> leaders, right? So, but he at least acknowledged oh, that maybe he shouldn't have. Could get. <laughs> the point, though, yeah, yeah. is that God keeps giving us these opportunities to see who's learned their lesson. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get too in the weeds about Ukraine, Russia, but just to see everybody just swallow the narrative instantly, like no thought whatsoever, mm. instant. It shows you that nobody's learned their lesson. Everyone's nope, just yeah. going to jump back in to whatever they're spoon fed. Oh yeah, and so and that's the real issue. It's like, it's like it's a matter of authority, right? They get spoon fed something and they just jump on it. So, so, so oh, next, I'm sorry. Go the ahead. The next time Finish. they're spoon fed something else about uh, about racism, they're going to jump on that. Mm. Even even those who say they're against Grant's critical theory. Yep. Remember the Ahmad Arbery situation? There was a bunch of guys that said something like this. You see, now I've been very hesitant to jump on these uh, things, but this one I cannot abide. And it's like, well, what are you talking about? You saw thirty seconds of a clip, not even less. What yeah. do you mean you can't abide it? Because this one, this one, they, the media really promises is really racist this time. So it's like a little humility would go a long way. But the thing is, 
so few uh, leaders will ever show it. So yeah, they got COVID right. wrong. They failed the SATs, and they continue to fail because God. Well, that's why I said the, us more tests. the test is when I said the test. I'm saying the last two years oh, was yeah. the test. Totally. So I'm totally. saying. So I'm with you. It, it wasn't a, a like an SAT in the sense that you show up for one day and take. It was two years. Yeah, yeah. Of of a string of tests. Yeah, just and again, I'm talking about the guys who just again. they yes. failed them all. Yes. They you know like instead of pass with flying colors, they failed all two years of tests yes. with flying colors. And I'm like, yeah, that guy, sh- we should be very, very slow. And, and to your point, John, to I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to keep jumping in because what you said was like, when I when I said J.D. Greer apologized, you're like, well, true, <laughs> true. Because that's another thing. It's like, yeah. it, Will, Willie Rice, you, you said, you know, he did this panel, whatever, and now he's against critical theory. You know, it would be nice to show a little humility and say, that's you know, right. I used to believe this, right. now I see it's wrong. I could believe someone like that. I could understand I, yeah, that. That's right. And I might be suspicious, but at least that would give me something. Yeah. What they do instead is pretend like they never said anything. It's yep, just they like they run out there's front of no the parade repentance. and act like they've been leading. And that's exactly like I it's it is it's it takes humility. It's uncomfortable. But I had to do that. Our church, we closed You've down. You've been for, wrong before? Uh, yeah. Our, our church closed down for two weeks, <laughs> two weeks when COVID hit. And and I felt like I gotta tell the church something. Yeah. So I did a, a quick little video, less than 10 minutes, and I sent it to the members in the church, uh, talking about Romans. 13 how we need to submit to the civil magistrate and i had to and i had to you know and so we skipped we skipped two weeks with within within two weeks it's a trap uh within two weeks i realized oh my gosh i i'm completely wrong yeah. it took me two more weeks so four total um to convince enough of my elders one of them i was never able to convince but to convince a majority of them to where we could outvote um the the, the tyrant and then and then my first sermon to the church was a correct exegesis of Romans 13 and and not with the fine print being, and this is what I've always believed, but with the beginning of the sermon being, you may sure. remember when I sent out a video that said the yeah. exact opposite of what I'm about to preach. You drew attention and to it. And I'm yeah. not going to treat you as though you are so stupid yeah. that you can't notice the contradiction, the blatant direct contradiction between what I'm going to preach from God's word today and what I said four weeks ago. I was, so you might be wondering, well, these contradict. Can they both be right? We're not relativists. Let me let me put you at ease. There's a real simple answer. I was wrong. Yeah. Imagine but, that. but here's the deal. Even guys who are in our camp, they don't do that. I, I we want, know who those guys are. I wanted to go back, if I could, uh, to something you said earlier, uh, and it, you kind of hinted at this. It's, a, it's an authority issue. The whole thing boils down to an authority issue. And with the Ukraine situation that's happening right now, there's guys that were even like the skeptical of the COVID narrative, skeptical of BLM and all that. But they're like within like 12 hours, they, they couldn't have shown you the Donbass region on a map. They didn't know who Zelensky was, but they're like all in for like, you know, white hat, black hat. We need to yep. send in, you know, military support and all this. And it, it, it that's the thing I think that was disconcerting for me a little bit. It's not, it's not like your political position on that as much as it is like, why did it take so little to convince yeah. you? Like a few images, most of them, now, like a lot of this stuff is fake news anyway that we've, right. we've yeah. figured out. And, and and a narrative coming from where? Yeah. Coming coming from the media. The again. same media you right. recognized was lying to you for so, years. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. just, so it reminds me of something, if I could just do a shout out to uh, Brother Joseph Spurgeon out there. He's, he's on Facebook and uh, I don't know, I think he's on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network too, yeah. right? Yep. Patriot so podcast. He was, him and I were at a, a conference and um, he had said, was in a really great sermon that uh, one of the points he made was that Christians are very skeptical about what the media says about them personally. They, like the media is always liars when it talks about them, but when it talks about those other guys out there, yeah. right? It's like, oh, we believe what it says. And I, I remember thinking at the time, I was like, I've never, I've never really thought of that. But yeah. I started the wheels started turning, and I'm like, that's actually very true. Yeah, right. Like we we do tend to like look at the media and think like, oh, what it's saying in an area that I'm not knowledgeable about is probably true, even though I know in the areas I am knowledgeable about, it's spreading lies. Sure. Mm-hmm. And and so we, I don't know. That's a weakness somewhere that we got to like get over and be like, okay, the authority is obviously number one. It's the word of God. Uh, we, we trust what that says. If, if the media reports anything contrary to human nature or whatever, we got to be skeptical of that because the word of God's our authority. But then, you know, we got to do the, the work of trying to find sources that are going to tell us the truth and not just right. 
you know, go with the narrative that's out there. Yeah. Right. And that's knee jerk. I, I told you that, like, I remember you text me in AD about the Russia thing and you're like, this is crazy. And I don't understand yeah. why so many like just hook, line and sinker people believe in this narrative. And if I speak out against it, it's like, this is a really sensitive thing where like even people who are anti CRT and anti woke and anti civil and medical tyranny, um, are, are you would think that they they would have suspicions about this too but they don't and i remember i texted you one of the things i said was that the the first thing that made me think of was the scene from the lion the witch in the wardrobe where you know lucy goes into narnia through the wardrobe the first time and then she comes back she tells all of her siblings about it and they're giving her a hard time and of course don't believe her and treating her like she's crazy or or like she's lying and, and it sets up the framework for c.s lewis with his you know his apologetics his liar lunatic or lord argument you know so lucy is either a lunatic she's she's gone mad where she's a liar um, and there's a moral deficiency or or she's telling the truth and and everybody all of her siblings peter and susan and edmund don't believe her and then edmund follows her just to pick on her one day and and they go in a second time but this time edmund's with her and then they come back and and lucy's like oh it's so wonderful because this time edmund came into the the wardrobe so now he can vouch for me he can validate my testimony that, that this place actually exists and so she's like um edmund tell him tell him tell peter and susan you were in narnia you saw it and edmund says oh silly girl just pretending and uh, and she just weeps. She becomes just a, a puddle of of just shame and and embarrassment, just weeping, and, and not just shame and embarrassment, but this real personal hurt and betrayal from her brother, who saw it with her his own eyes, and is just cruel, just malicious and cruel, and and just wants to hurt her. And so Professor Diggory, Diggory Kirk, who's who's you know the the person that they're staying with because the parents are at the war and all that kind of stuff. He's kind of their guardian. Um, the older siblings, Peter and Susan, go to him. And they're talking to him and he's like, what's wrong with the little girl, with Lucy, she, the weeping girl? Um, they're like, well, she's, you know, she's very sad. And he's like, hence the weeping. Uh, he's like, Obviously she's sad. What's she sad about? And they're like, well, Edmund, you know, Edmund was pretending that Narnia exists with her and she really believes in it. Um, but then, you know, let her down and, and, you know, he was egging her on. He was, he was enticing her by, he shouldn't have enabled her. He was enabling her by pretending that Narnia is real. And he's like, well, why, why isn't it real? Um, and they're like, well, it's of course illogical that a whole other world would exist in wardrobe. And he says, logic, what do they teach kids in schools these days? And he's like, so Edmund is usually the truthful one, right? And they're like, well, no, this would be the first. And Lucy, she's usually lying. Well, no, she's normally always truthful. And he said, then logically, you should assume she's telling the truth. Right. Is fantastical as it might sound. And so I'm thinking about that principle. I know I, I, I just did the whole book of Narnia. And you guys are you know, <laughs> you're both looking at me like, is he going to wrap it? But, but my point is, I, that principle is a profound principle that we should apply, I think, when we come into any news. Um, if the source is the legacy media... And our political leader, like, have they said anything true over the last two years? Why, why should we immediately assume that they all of a sudden started today? And the thing is, ignorance is fine. If you don't know, you don't know. We, we can't possibly, with everything going on in the world, know everything and apply what the sure. Bible says to everything because we're limited. Sure. And that's totally fine. It's just, but, you know, you don't jump on the bandwagon right. if you, in ignorance. So that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a concern I have that, you know, we're... When are we going to have that? Um, and, and many of us do. So I'm not trying to like paint with broad brush here, but like there, there is a problem somewhere along the line, even with Christians, where we, we tend to just believe narratives coming from people that like, they don't even share our, our basic uh, ideas about ethics and uh, the agenda that we would have for the world. Theirs is diametrically opposed, but we believe them. It's like w without information. So, so we got to check up on things if, if it's important enough to... Yep. Yeah. Here's one question I have, and, and then maybe we could end with this, but um, re remember the, I don't know how to pronounce it, and I'm the pastor between the three of us, so you guys are just going to make fun of me, but Ephraimites, is that how you would say it? Ephraimites? Ephraimites, Ephraimites? yeah. Okay. There we Ephraimites. Go. I think I had a, a can that would like get rid of those things. No, those are termites. <laughs> termites, sorry. So the Ephraimites, right, the word that they couldn't pronounce, Shibboleth? Okay. Right? Is that how you say it? Shibboleth? Is I think that how so. You guys... Sounds okay. right, yeah. Shibboleth. Yeah. So there's this, this one Hebrew word <laughs> that they, you know, aren't able to pronounce and and their their failure to pronounce this word would oust them. You know, where they would be caught that they weren't actually Israelites. That they in, And so they couldn't fly under the radar and pretend. Right. And so my question is, um, as guys, like Willie Nelson, <laughs> <laughs> um, Willie Rice, as guys are, and he's not the only one, he's just one example, but, but now that we're winning... 
at least in some sense. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of work to do, but the tides are turning. There is at least a remnant enough to where um, the opportunists, right? They'll still be the ideologues and they'll just out, they'll, they'll show their own colors because they're proud to do so. Sure. But there, but there are the opportunists who play the field. And as these guys who haven't actually repented, but are simply, simply just following the money, following the fame, following the, the tide, as these guys start to shift and, and, and are trying to speak the language and, and they can now say, oh yeah, woke. I'm not woke. Oh yeah. CRT is bad. Um, what is, what is our, our variation of shibboleth in this hour that those guys still, what are the words they still can't say? I, I don't know about words necessarily, but, but doctrines, to, but, but, but to me, it's like, you know, critical race theory. I've, I've used the term on my channel before, but if you had a way to just see how many times I use that word or CRT, I just very rarely use it because it really doesn't even matter to me so much yeah. exactly what, you know, school this came from or whatever. Right. Um, so to me, it's whether or not they're, they're, they're accepting sort of this idea of, uh, of, you know, racial reconciliation, kingdom diversity. They're still using that kind of lingo right. because honestly, like, like r racial reconciliation, like it sounds like a nice term, but it, it, all it is, it just means critical race theory. That's what it means. Like r r racial reconciliation, the, the actual battles, many of these battles have been won for a long time mm -hmm. where, you know, blacks couldn't come to the same restaurant as you. That's not, that's not a thing anymore, right? right? That's not a thing anymore. So like, you know, churches that, that, that didn't allow you to join if you were black or Puerto Rican, maybe they still exist, but point them out and everyone will criticize them, including yeah, me. Oh, yeah. So, so like. To me, like anyone who's still talking about this as if it's a major issue in the affirmative, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, we're still fundamentally racist culture. I don't care what terms they use to describe themselves. Pretty much to the man, they're all critical race theorists. Yeah. All of them. No, you're right. You're so right. it's not really a term. It's just that, because I, I have a feeling that, I don't know this about Willie Rice, but I have a feeling that he'll probably still talk about stuff like that, you know, about how we need, we need to eliminate the disparities and things right. like that. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he's a critical race well, he, theorist. He had a one sermon. I was so, so this week, I have two podcasts dropping about him because I listened to like five of his sermons. And he had one where literally the first half of the sermon was 16, 19 project stuff. Yeah. He literally took a sequence from Phil Vischer. I recognized it because I was like, this, this is the same exact order and the same yeah. exact thing Phil Vischer talks yeah. about to talk about, you know, show disparities. And, and then the second half of the sermon was like 1776. Like I mean, he was trying to like wed these things together in this weird, weird yep. way. Um, and, and so like he starts off the sermon with saying like the, the death of George, George Floyd has affected all of us and you know, the racism in this country. Right. And then, but I'm sorry, like, I don't have to hear the rest of the sermon. That's right. You're 100%. already in critical race theory 100%. land. Yeah, no, you're, you're assuming right. yeah, that yeah. was racism that killed George Floyd. And somehow the church is somehow yeah. complicit and we need correction That's right. and the disparities are evidence of this. Yes. But but yet I'm also going to say we are thankful for the police and we don't think all those monuments should come down in right. America is a great place. I'm going to stand for the flag. And it's like, yeah. well, like you're just trying to please like right. you're yeah. just playing the field. You're it, an opportunity. It, it, and what we're definitely not saying, and I want to speak for you, but I think I can in this case. Yeah, do it. Is that <laughs> there is no racism in the country. Obviously, there is. The people are racist. Duh. There are racists yeah, out there. Of course. There. What we're talking about, though, is sort of this. This this is like the biggest problem that we face. It's a public health crisis, right. you know. And and then like for example, any he's one hundred percent right. Anyone who mentions George Floyd as evidence for the racial divide in our country um, is obviously not talking from a biblical worldview. Because the only reason it is evidence of anything is because they're forcing the issue and pretending it is right. So so it, it is evidence of something. It's not a racial divide. It's a fundamental ideology ideological divide. But the thing is like like at this point. Anyone talking about this that's not critical of it and and saying you know and, and fighting against this kind of stuff, I'm sorry, but they're embracing critical race theory on some level and most of them whole cloth. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, I think asking because another way you can rephrase the question you asked is okay. Well, yeah, you, you guys are answering it perfectly. Just the opposite side, which is super helpful. You're saying yeah. these are like instead of there are certain good words that they can't say. Uh, which is kind of like the way I phrase the question, but you guys are saying there are bad things that they still say. Every time I've ever and, heard and somebody that, say this guy, this guy talks about systemic racism, but they do it the right way. Every single single time I've heard that, they do it exactly like everybody does. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. they, they use different words. Can, can I give you an example of that? So at uh, Liberty University, there was a professor of evangelism that was teaching a class and using the curriculum that they were providing for him, and it had a term in it called it was cultural awareness. 
or and um or no cultural intelligence sorry cultural intelligence and i'm like well i've never heard that term before and right this is right when critical race theory is kind of like not really that you know you shouldn't really say that right it's out of vogue it, it's yeah people's <laughs> antennas go up but like cultural intelligence like they'll never suspect so i was reading i was looking at the curriculum because there was a student in the class who gave it to me and i'm like well, this is just like the same racial reconciliation stuff repackaged for mm -hmm. this new term and um and and then i remember i like did a podcast on it and 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 i i got you know people from the school were mad at me like i didn't understand what he was really saying like the whole nine yards that, that i'm used to and um then all of a sudden like i heard the term pop up in a crew a lenses institute video they're doing this whole thing and it's blatantly pro critical race theory and they start using this term cultural intelligence and then there was i think it was after that i saw an erlc piece and it was using the phrase cultural intelligence and i was like wait a minute, like, is this the new word? Is yeah, this right. like, they're, they're switching? Cause yep. like the other, and that's what the left does so often. Like yep. if, now everyone's like motivated about critical race theory. The left is on to something else. Right. They're always two steps ahead. And so you have to, I think 80, what 80's saying is absolutely true. And you have to understand like, what are, what do they actually believe like conceptually? Right. Uh, you know, what, so, so a good question maybe would be something like, do we get a better interpretation of reality and, and the Bible in particular, the more diverse perspectives represented in the interpretation yeah. process? <laughs> like that might- That's a good question. It's that, a trap question. I like it. Yeah. And like yeah. these guys could lie. Like they could, right. like we, we're assuming consistency and even right. asking sure. a question, but you know, that would get more at the heart of it. Uh, you, you could ask like, hey, does this disparity in, in healthcare and I don't know, you could list you know, all sorts of other things, income, yep. like, does that, does that necessarily mean it's a, it's an issue of justice? Right. Like if someone says that that's a justice issue, then yeah, you know, like automatically sure. like, okay, you're wrong then. That's just not what yeah. the Bible uh, tells us. So like, we, you just have to be really, I think, shrewd in thinking through these questions. And if you have like a pastoral candidate coming in and you, you want to test them on these things, you're, you're just going to, I did a, an episode where I had like 10 of them, like 10 questions I came up with to right. like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, just think through like what would be a good question in the, whatever moment we're in, yep. you know, that would get to the heart of the issue. I think yep. keeping it open ended would be good too. Like, you yeah. know, are racial disparities a problem or are, are they sinful? You know, and, and if, if so, why kind of thing? Like, like, cause honestly, keeping it open ended, don't help him out. You, you, you would, you would be like, he's going to have to say, if he's woke, he's going to have to say, yes, I'm, I'm interested in the explanation. Right. Because that'll tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? If it's like, you know, I, you know, yes, but you know, <laughs> sometimes these things happen. Like, okay, that's one thing. But like, if it's yes, any explanation that he gives is is very likely going to be very woke. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe they have a good explanation, and and that's fine. It'd be the first time I've ever heard one. But yeah, but there you go. I mean, this thought just came to me. What like here? Here would be like maybe a good idea for a pastoral search committee if you give them like a, a document to fill out. Give them a scenarios to navigate like real church scenarios like okay you have a girl comes to you says they're abused by someone in the church like do you you know just walk us through like how do you handle this scenario is your you know do you believe them immediately do you like what do you do do you call the police do you like yeah. um and you may come up with other scenarios like sure. and these are real scenarios i'm thinking of someone comes into your sure. church uh, like a family that says, hey, it's racist to sing these Anglican, uh, these Anglo hymns, which is a real situation sure. that, that the pastor told me about. Um, like, what do you do? Do you cater to their preference just because they're, right. you know, and why would you cater to like, they have to think through this and, and that's going to reveal the assumptions. So yeah. that's yeah, a, that's no, a really right. good point. And, and the other thing too is whether or not they're, they know the terms they, they, when they explain themselves, you're going to know where their foundations are. Cause the thing is a lot of times people are like, well, I've never even read a critical race theory book. It's like, well, you, you, you know, you understand like you yeah. can, you can be influenced by an ideology that you can't identify. We right. all can yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. even I can be, we have to be humble about this. Like we could be our, the way we think through things can be affected by, uh, a, 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 a system of thinking that we right. couldn't even name. We all we have ask presuppositions us. and we're not you know aware I mean? of all of them. So, so I think, yeah, keeping it open-ended and, 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 and I don't even know how we got on this topic, but keeping it open-ended is the shibboleth question. Yeah, there, yeah. there it is. That's right. That's it's a legitimate it was, question. Yeah. yeah. The, keeping it open-ended, you know, and hearing them out. But to be honest, I, I, I think, you know, John agrees with me. Like if they're at this point, I've seen so much, I've heard every explanation under the sun about why this guy's different. If they're talking about this kind of stuff, the George Floyd incident at all in an, in an affirming kind of way, yeah. they're, I mean, they're woke. That's yeah, bottom line. Sure. You just got to figure out a way to get them to admit it.
Right. Yeah. <laughs> or or they don't even have to admit it. You can just walk away. Or you yeah, can just yeah. walk away and just, just say no. Away. That's a that's a possibility too. With that being said, though, I think that's just one of the difficulties is people are trying to find church, and and I think some people have milked it a little bit. Guys who we would agree with, you know, and some of you may be listening to this, and you've made YouTube your church, you've made Gab your church, and like and you agree with us, and we agree with you, and we're thankful for your support. But all three of us would say, you need to go to church. Absolutely. You need to get in a church. Absolutely. And I think some people are kind of like, well, the church has discredited itself. And yes, it has. We All those things, we sympathize, we agree. Um, but you need to get in a church. And I think part of the difficulty is people just are struggling finding, finding a church because it's like, you know, like there's just... The, the dust is still settling and we're still looking. That's why I'm saying like, are there good words that we can use that, 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 that the woke won't be able to articulate, right? Are there, because, because that's what we've had in the past, right? So with the reform, non-reform divide, um, any church that had on their website, we're Calvinist or we're reformed, you know, like there were people who, who like were, who hated you could, you could reform just fly the theology. Confederate flag. That'll well, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, that could be it. That could be it. Um, what, well, one thing that I do is I, I'll try to use the word patriarchy, like because there's not a lot of guys who will say I'm patriarchal, and that immediately it's like, well, what does that have to do with that's the woke a good thing? Point. But that's that a good like point. that helps to like. That's a good word. So what are the identifying like? Because like Driscoll back in the day, right? So with Acts 29, like despite you know faults and strengths, I you know I'm kind of torn on Driscoll. I like a lot of stuff about him and don't like some stuff. But the point and what I definitely I think all three of us would agree is that Christianity today, uh, Driscoll doesn't need to be tried by a bunch of feminists. So so whoever you know wh- whatever he did that's wrong, um, Christianity today is not in the place. This is why I like coming on your him. show because you're the one who gets in trouble, not yeah. me. <laughs> So you're you're going to get in trouble for your laugh, by yeah. your agreeable laugh, AD. Yeah. By is, comparison, I'm, the, I'm, right. I'm reasonable. Russell Moore and Beth Moore, <laughs> the sisters, um, two sisters. Uh, but anyways, so all that being said, like, you know, Driscoll had a flag and we weren't even sure what it was. You know what I mean? There weren't sure. actual terms. It was just, like, we knew he was a Calvinist. Yeah. But then there were intangibles that we couldn't even articulate but that, but that we knew this is who he is. And if you're a part of his network, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, it can become too all about one man or whatever. But if you're a part of his network, I can expect, if I like these things and I think these things matter, I can expect to find these things. Instead of trying 20 churches over the course of three years, I can find a church that is Acts 29, a part of Driscoll's network and expect to have some and, and so what I'm saying, everything's still kind of, it's still too new. It's, it's still, yeah. still too yeah. recent. The dust hasn't even settled exactly. But we eventually are going to need yeah. some some way of being able to say, like, I don't want to spend three years to find a biblical church that's not woke. Yeah, I don't want to go to a church and make friendships, deep, meaningful friendships over the course of 18 months yeah. and then find out that they have a diversity council. Yeah. Right. You know, because all of a sudden they're asking me to be on it because I'm, you know, one eighteenth Cherokee Indian or whatever. You know, like I, I'm sorry by the so, way. <laughs> so forgive me. Yeah. Anyways, anyways. I, I, he apologized to me earlier at lunch, and I, I paid for your meal. It I was your reparations. <laughs> reparations, right? <laughs> I'm not one eighteenth Cherokee. I was just making up a random example. So He's still sorry. <laughs> well, neither, yeah. yeah, neither is Elizabeth Warren. You're good. Okay, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, you're right. <laughs> so, anyways, my point is, we're gonna need that. We're gonna need the shibboleth word or flag or something, or something and, yeah. and not because we're trying to make it about us not because it's man-centered not because we need one guy you know his face you know to it, it's not none of that but there is something practically helpful about about helping christians who feel lost right now who haven't been a member in a church for two years some of them it's because they're milking covid and those kind of things but some of them they literally it's not their fault they can't find a church and we need to be able to yeah help them if i could say quick in closing i mean this is the reason that we did put discerningchristians.com together right. so yeah, we yeah. do have an, a network there that people can go and, and you can add your church you know you can look at and see if there's churches in your area uh usually i recommend two people check out if, if they don't find anything there just like go to sermon audio just see what's in your area and the, and the beauty is you can listen to these guys and you know see what you think first you can search yeah. their their sermon library um which will also help you you know give give get a good idea uh, but you know the important thing is like not not just to trust God in this. God has His people in every place. God hasn't gone anywhere. Truth is still solid out there. God's raising up people, and He uses the weak people sometimes. It may not look like what you think. It may be yeah. like a, a church plant. It may you may be the guy that needs to like step it up and and plant the church. So a lot of people are doing that right now. 
So you know, don't don't have a crisis of faith in in the things that actually matter. They, they haven't gone anywhere. Mm-hmm. They're still there. Like your God's still there. Your family's still there. Your you know your hometown it's still intact. The buildings are still up. The people are still the you know still some, just need Jesus unless it's in up. Ferguson, Missouri. No, <laughs> some, uh, of the some of the buildings are still, buildings up. Are still up. Yeah, yeah. but um, but like yeah, I mean it, it feels like. I think crazy that so many things have changed that people's heads are still spinning, trying right. to figure out what's going on. You know, so I think that's the whole conspiracy things about that is like trying to figure out what's a paradigm that makes sense of this. Right. But the things that really, really, truly matter, they're still there. Right. They haven't gone anywhere. So just, you know, take hope. That's good. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Wait, 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 real quick before you go, do me a favor, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Click the bell so you'll be notified with all our new content as it comes out on a daily basis. And if you're willing to support this ministry, you can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate. Thanks so much. God bless.